الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء أشرف المرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد Now in the discussion of the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam we are at the earlier times yani this is before the birth of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam but with regards to that which is related to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam we talked about Ibrahim alayhi salatu salam and Sara alayhi salam being in Misr and what happened with the king and how the king gave his daughter what is Raja is his daughter as a servant to Sara. As I was looking at some of the ages and things, we don't have anything clear in hadith about their ages, but it seems like from Siyat that she was very young. Hajar alayhi salam at that time was very young. Sara alayhi salam could not have children. But that's not really the reason. I mean, some people say they, they, they say definitely that's the reason why uh, Ibrahim alayhi salam was married to Hajar alayhi salam. Allah alam. What we know is that Sara alayhi salam encouraged Ibrahim alayhi salam to marry Hajar alayhi salam. And years passed here. It's not like she came and suddenly, no. And here, Hajar alayhi salam was married to Ibrahim alayhi salam at the same time that Sarah alayhi salam was married to Ibrahim alayhi salam. And this is something interesting when people talk about polygamy and things in Islam. If you look in the Bible, you will find more references to polygamy than the Quran. If you actually go through each person that's mentioned having multiple wives in the Old Testament, which is in the part of the Bible as we see today, you will find tons of references, even the ahkam of polygamy and all of that's in, in the Bible. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed Hajar alayhi salam with a child. And this was the first child of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Ibrahim alayhi salam now, as you know, he was moving, he was giving da'wah, he was having debates with kings and being thrown in fires and all of this that he was doing. And at that time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't give him a child. And he imagine, it must have been hard. Like, you know, you are a Nabi of Allah, you are a Rasul, you are يعني, Ibrahim, and he's from the greatest, the best known Anbiya. And Allah didn't give him a child for this whole time. And that teaches us something, to be patient when Allah writes something in Qadr, because Allah wrote something for him that was best for him, but he had to wait for it. Now he's old. And in that old age, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses him with a child. And this child, as we know, will grow to be a Nabi of Allah as well. So not just a child, but a Nabi, a very pious child, Ismail alayhi salam. Now he has a wife and a little child. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala order him? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders him to take them to Mecca. At this time, there is nothing in Mecca. Yani there is no building, there is no built Kaaba. What is correct is at this time, there was no building of Kaaba. Was it a holy place? Yes. From the time of Adam alayhi salam. Was it built up? No. Nobody lived there. There was no well of Zamzam there. There was no greenery there. There were no date trees or... Uh, if you've been to Mecca, the, the landscape is harsh to begin with. So now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered them to go to this one spot. Right? Now this is another test. So, he takes Hajar alayhi salam and Ismail. Now, what I want to clarify. We find a lot of ulema and a lot of du'at and a lot of books. They say that Sara alayhi salam, she had a jealousy with Hajar alayhi salam. That Sara was jealous of Hajar alayhi salam because Hajar yani, first was a servant to her and now it became a co-wife and then Allah gave her a child and Sara didn't. All of this I cannot find any authentic evidence for. Most of these ideas come from Israeliyat. They come from the narrations from the Yahud and Nasara and things from the people of the book before Islam. 
There are some mentions in Mawquf Rawayat, yani from Sahaba and things, but I, as I found, all of them to be weak. And it contradicts what is in the Sahih Hadith that will come, inshallah, when Ibrahim is walking away. So this concept is incorrect. Sarah alayhi salam is a very pious woman. She's not going to tell her husband to take a, a co-wife and, and, and leave her in the middle of a desert just because she's jealous. She's the one that told him to marry her. La, this is the Amr of Allah. This is the order of Allah. And Ibrahim alayhi salam is, is a responsible husband and father. He's not going to throw one wife in the desert because the other wife is jealous. And this is... These are things we have to clarify because we hear a lot of du'at and a lot of sira lessons and they're saying this, but what is the evidence? And look at the implications you're making from it. La, what we find in the clear sahih ahadith, and inshallah we'll go over them as, uh, today inshallah, is that this was an order of Allah. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had ordained that Mecca would become populated. Mecca would become the center for Hajj. It would be the center where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would be born there. So how would he be born there if Ismail alayhi wa didn't go there? So here what is correct is that this was not due to jealousy or any kind of infighting that had nothing to do with it. What it was is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered Ibrahim alayhi salatu salam to take his young wife and child to Mecca. And he did. And he did not tell them why they're going. And this is something amazing. When you have a wise and pious leader, whether it's in a household, whether it's in a community, whether it's in a khilafa, whether it's in... It is not upon them to have to explain everything to everybody. Ibrahim didn't have to explain, you know, we're going to go to Mecca and I'm going to leave you there and I'm going to leave you 30 dates and these many, this much water and then I'm going to be, when are you going to be back? No, he said, we're going, we're going. That's it. And Hajar didn't ask, she went. Look at the, the great example you have in her. So they went on this huge journey. Now imagine from Sham to Mecca at that time is a very harsh journey to begin with in a desert environment. There's danger, there are bandits, I mean, all this kind of stuff. They get there, there's nothing. Not even like, like it's not even like, you know, like when people are stuff about this, why you shouldn't watch cartoons about the seerah and things like this or movies and things, because it gives you an image that's incorrect. Like people watch that message movie and then they think of some kafir actor every time they think of Hamza radiallahu anhu. And you cannot compare to the ru'ab of Hamza radiallahu anhu. Or some actor from Qatar, now we think of him as, Alhamdulillah, I never watched it, but Umar ibn Khattab. No, Umar Khattab, his status is something else. So you think, you think it's like the sand dunes and desert. It wasn't. This is hard rock desert. Mecca is mountains and rock. So you're in this place, not a human being, not a tree, no water. Ibrahim alayhi salam puts them down, sets them up. Leave them few dates and things, nothing much. And he starts to walk away. Doesn't say a word. Subhanallah. And when you think of Hajar alayhi salam, you know, when you go from, to Mecca and you go Sa'i, think about these things. What a test. I mean, for our sisters today, imagine. Now, just to give some context, brothers, don't take your wife today and leave her in a desert. Allah didn't give you a wahi order for this. Okay, don't make an excuse now. Some of the brothers, I'm gonna go 40 days, khalas. I'm leaving my wife, no food, no money, let her back from the neighbors. Ibrahim alayhi salam did it. Ibrahim alayhi salam had a wahi from Allah. Did you have wahi? No? Then don't do it. Don't, don't apples and oranges, understand your place, right? But at the same time, there is an aspect here of tawakkun that we should learn from. I mean, even if we don't do it at the level of Ibrahim alayhi salam, but at the same time, if your husband, if your son, if your father is going to go do something for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and if he does his best to provide for you what he can, then also be patient with it. As Hajar alayhi salam, I mean the example that you have. Hajar alayhi salam, she starts to ask Ibrahim, it's only natural. I mean, Ibrahim alayhi salam just starts walking away, he doesn't say anything to her. He just starts walking. And she's like, who are you leaving us to? 
There is nobody here. There are no people. There's no food. There's no gardens. There's no water. A woman by herself and a little baby, a breastfeeding baby. Who are you leaving us to? He doesn't answer. Why? It's the wrong question. Like today, imagine, it's the wrong question. So she realizes that. And then she asks, is this the order of Allah? This is Sahih Hadith. I looked at the Asanid today. So don't. <laughs> right? She said, is this the order of Allah? He says, yes. Now this is a dalil that this had nothing to do with jealousy between wives. Because here he told her, Sarihan, clearly, yes, this is the order of Allah. She says, in that case, Allah will not abandon us. Tawakkul, amazing. A woman by herself with a breastfeeding child, no food, no weaponry. Men could attack, they could rape, kill, pillage. You got Bedouins around, you got I mean, all kinds of dangers. But she realized if it's the Amr of Allah, khalas, Allah is enough for us. This is a woman. Wallahi, our men don't have this iman today. Our men are not rijal today. They may be I mean, males, but they're not men. Everybody's scared. Everybody's... Hajar alayhi salam, she's like, you know what? If it's order of Allah, Allah is enough for me. I don't need anything from you. Go. Ibrahim alayhi salam, he walks until they cannot see him. And this is very important. Because he's not... Uh, billah. I mean, this is... Billah. Some of the people, uh, they make kufr by saying things that they don't realize they should say. Right? There is some du'at, may Allah protect us. This is why I don't recommend you guys watching anybody's videos unless you know them to be upon the kitab or sunnah. Some of them, they said, Na'udhu Billah, Ibrahim he was a deadbeat dad. He just left. And this is kufr. La, this is kufr. To call a Nabi something like this takes you outside the fold of Islam. Ibrahim salam didn't just leave his wife and this is an order of Allah. And he has those feelings. Imagine this is his wife and this is his one child that he had after all those years in dua and asking Allah. How difficult of an order of Allah is that? Imagine one of us is told by Allah though, that even though don't get any ideas because there's no more wahi coming down from Jibreel I don't want one of you guys to be like, I, I got wahi. Because our brothers will handle you here, man. They'll take you outside and set you straight. Okay? But if Allah did test one of us like this, small baby, breastfeeding, young wife, leave them in a desert with nobody, walk away. How difficult would that be? So Ibrahim has those emotions. He's not, it's not that he doesn't have those. So he goes to a place where they can't see him because he doesn't want them to become weak by seeing him. And he's making dua. And this dars, I didn't want to go too deep into the story because I really want to get to the uh, part about Rasulullah sallallahu But when you have time, go and look at the dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam. And it's mentioned repeatedly in the Quran. I was looking to the different ayat. And it's not at one time. This is a mistake people think. Why? I'll give you a dalil, quick, and I'm not going to go deep, but inshallah, those brothers who have uh, the love, they will go and look it up themselves. Sometimes it mentions baladan. Baladan, balad, uh, yani, uh, without alif lam. Nakara. Baladan. Sometimes it's al balad. Al balad here is ma'rifa. In the Quran, same dua, same type of dua from Ibrahim alayhi salam. So I looked up why. Why is one time nakira and one time ma'rifa? One time it's just baladan without the alif lam. One time it's with the alif lam. And the tafsir that I found authentically is that one, the first one is nakira because at that time there was nothing built. And the second time is when he came back and he made dua again, but now buildings had been built, so alif lam was added. And something beautiful that most people don't think about. So that means. Ibrahim salam kept coming back. I found eight different times 
that is documented of him coming back and it could be that he came back many more times. So he didn't just leave them. So when he has them there and he gets where they cannot see him, he starts to make dua. And it's beautiful dua and it's mentioned in the Quran and with different alfaz, look it up. But making dua for them to have aman, to have peace, to have uh, the, the best of fruits and foods from all over the world and for the people to go there and to, uh, to, to, to and he establish it and to love to go there. And it's so beautiful that when you think about it today, the dua of Ibrahim has come to in front of us. Subhanallah, even a fasir, a fajir, somebody who's a sinner, horrible. You tell them you want to go to Mecca and I'm ready. Even if they are somebody who's lazy with their salawat and deal with riba and have a liquor store, I want to go to Mecca. Why? Is Mecca tropical? Is it flush green like Switzerland or Swat Valley or Bagman? Is it beautiful scenery like mountainous, like the Himalayas? Is it beautiful beaches like San Diego or Caribbean, Hawaii? No, it is probably the ugliest, harshest terrain. No, no, no. Okay, take it easy. Just talking about the terrain that you can think of. It's not even like the Sahara soft desert. Right? It's harsh terrain. Nobody goes there for the sightseeing of the beautiful locality. But that is the beauty of it being there, that it checks your ikhlas. If Mecca was يعني, like, I don't know, يعني, some beautiful resort, Aspen, right? <laughs> then people would be like, you know what? Yeah, let's go for Umrah. I'll go do some skiing and, you know, I'll hang out, enjoy the beautiful waterfalls, and, and I'll do Umrah too. <laughs> but that's not the way Mecca is. You go to Mecca, you're Umrah or Hajj, that's what you're going for. But even then, it is one of, and if not the most visited place in the world. Like, I'm not running stats here. But, think about it. People from all over the world, millions, not just the Hajj. All year, Umrah is going on, even if the visas are shut down. People are going, people that work there, people that work in other cities are going. People from other countries are going, people that are there uh, on some other visa are going. Constantly people, in, even a fasiq, a fajr, يعني, some, uh, but it would really, a sinful person that goes there, always wants to go back. I used to speak to some brothers, يعني, here and there, in different countries and stuff, and you talk to somebody who was away from the religion, and you try to give them nasiha and things, you know. And every time that I can think of when Mecca would come up, he'd be like, man, I want to go. I've never been, but I want to go. I'm going to shut down this liquor store someday, <laughs> and I'm going to go. Or I'm going to get rid of this job at the bank because I went for Hajj and I just want to go back. Every time people want to go back. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is the, and, and when you go to Mecca, you will find all kinds of foods. Foods that you can't, I mean, I found avocados last time. I was like, how do they have avocados in Mecca? I thought that was a California thing. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam come true. Ibrahim alayhi salam, he left. I wish I could talk more about the dua in each part of it, but we get sidetracked. And so he left. Now he's gone. Who's left there? Hajar alayhi salam. Who's with her? Ismail alayhi salam. The few dates are finished, obviously. Time is going hot. No cover, no shade. Now her breast milk runs dry. I mean, you got to eat for breast milk, right? And this tells you that a good amount of time passed. It's not like he left and suddenly this happened. Right? Now what, what sabab does she have? There is nothing. There is no water, there is no food, there is no grass you can cut up and eat. It's just desert, harsh, rock environment. And now her child starts to cry. Ismail is crying. Subhanallah, how difficult is that? You're hungry. You're thirsty yourself, and now your child is crying. It's not the child's fault. He's hungry. 
It's not your fault. You don't have any milk. You have no means. Does she say, look at this, Ibrahim just left me like this. What kind of a husband is he? Oh, Nabi of Allah. Oh, yeah. Big pious guy. Big sheikh. Yeah. This is sheikh, huh? Just left your wife like this? And your baby, you don't care about your children? Huh? La. La. This is why. This is why. You go and run those. This is why. La. She was patient. When her patience was pushed, she didn't complain. She didn't curse her qadr. La. She just ran. What else can she do from Safa to Marwa? And back, and back, starting from Safa to Marwa once, then back, that's two, then three, then four, then five, yelling, is there anybody that can give us something? Is there anybody that can hear me? Is there anybody that can bring any help? She's running. On her seventh, which will be at Marwa, she hears something. Now, she's in a state of shock because there's nobody there. But she hears something. And she says, is there somebody that can bring us something of benefit, some help? And when she looks, she sees Jibreel alayhi salam digging with his wing and in one of the riwayat with his foot. It was not from the kicking of Ismail alayhi salam like everybody thinks. It is not like he was kicking the ground and water started coming up, those, like those cartoons they make. There is no authentic narration for that. The clear Sahih Ahadith mentioned that Jibreel alayhi salam, one of the rawat with his wing, one with his leg, he dug into the ground and water came out. Subhanallah, did Allah starve Hajar and Ismail? No, it's a test. Ikhwan fillah, you get tested. Allah will never waste you. Allah will never let you be destroyed. Allah will test you. And those that are patient, Allah will raise their ranks. And those that fall, Allah doesn't need you. Here, Allah sent the best of the malaika, the greatest of the malaika, Jibreel alayhi salam, to go and dig. Supernatural as they would say. And this water came out. And there was no name for this water. This was not a well that was already there. Hajar alayhi salam, she sees this. And now she's human, right? And, and the human is always weak on tawakkul. No matter how great they may be in tawakkul, there's still a test, right? We're humans. And again, I mean, I'm saying this about a woman that her husband left her and she had tawakkul. But even then, she saw this water and instinctual, she thought, what if it just fades away? So she goes and she starts to, to put it together and to build, like, and get the earth around it to make it into a well, so the water doesn't just and he get uh, dry away or, or you know, just flows away. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the Sahih hadith, he says, May Allah have mercy on Hajar, our mother Hajar, alayhi salam. If she had left it, it would have been a flowing river. Allah would have made Zamzam a flowing river. Sahih hadith. But she started to put it, where she started to build around it, and, and in her language, Zam was to stop or to hold. And that's where Zam, Zam comes from. Zam, Zam is not an Arabic word. Zam, Zam, the water that you drink, the well, it's not an Arabic word. It's in her language. And it was to stop or to, or to hold. And she started to stop this water with Zam, Zam. And that's where Zam, Zam comes from. And now she had water. But what did she not have? Food, company, security, shelter. Right? But Alhamdulillah, she had water. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed her with such water that till today every Muslim around the world is drinking from. I thought about this and I don't think there is a Muslim in the world that hasn't drunk Zamzam. Because even if you haven't been to Mecca and Medina or Umrah or Hajj and even in Medina they would have yeah, in big buckets of it. I don't know if they still do, but in Saudi Arabia, 
they would pump it. People in Mecca, they would get it in their houses. They would drink it all day, they would make wudu with it. And other people in Saudi they would get it from Mecca and they would take it and they would have canisters at home. In Masjid al Nabwi, they used to have big canisters, you could drink it all day long. In Mecca, they have it all. People go and everybody drinks it. And everybody that goes for Umrah or Hajj takes bottles and buckets and canisters and tons of it back to their countries. And then they give it out to everyone. Everybody comes back from Hajj and Umrah, what do you do? You go to visit them, what do they do? Here is some zamza. And maybe some other things that they probably shouldn't be giving tasbihs and whatever, but yani, zamzam at least they give, right? And every part of the Muslim world, somebody is sick, what do they say? Bring us some zamzam. Stores have it, packaged, selling it. Subhanallah, how much of it is drank? How does a freshwater well last that long? People drink it and drink it and drink it. Not like other wells. Other wells, the people around it drink it, okay. Nobody pumps it out to like take it all over the world and everybody's just, you know, even when we go, we are drinking. I don't really drink a lot of water. Brothers know I'm always dehydrated, unfortunately, right? Man, uh, the only time I drink a lot is when I'm there. Wallahi, yani it's wonderful. Even though its taste is not sweet. Don't lie to yourselves. Some people are like, it tastes so wonderful. Uh, no, it doesn't. <laughs> Rasulullah Sallallahu told us, that this is not something that is going to be sweet of drink, but this is going to be loved by the believer. Why? Because we drink it, not because it tastes like spra- sparkling mountain. No, because this is, this is a water that is blessed. Zamzam is there. Now they have water. Jurhum, the qabila, and this is called Jurhum Athani. I mean, this is not the original Jurhum that we spoke about earlier in the Dus. But from them, they were an Arab tribe. And they were Bedouins. I mean, they would move from place to place. There is a lot in Tariq about whether they had to move because of a genocide and a war that they were in. And, but what we know is they were Bedouins. And they would move. As they are moving through this area, they see birds flocking in an area. And the Bedouins, they know their land. Bedouins, I mean, when we study Tariq later, inshallah, talk about Khalid and Walid and how he cut through different areas and how he got Bedouin guides, even when their eyes were sealed, they, they would know which way. Oh, amazing, right? They, they would know the land. Because that's what they did. They didn't just build buildings and live in houses. They would be moving. So they would have to know where water is. If you didn't know, you would die. Because <laughs> it's not like, okay, when's the next gas station so we can get some water? I mean, if you ran out of water and there's no water for 100 miles, you're going to die. So they would know. So they're moving and they see birds and they know birds go where there's water. And they're like, we know there's no water here. So that's something strange. So they said, let's investigate. Let's go check it out. So they go and they find water. And now, so imagine this. These are rough sword carrying Bedouin tribal men. And it's a whole tribe. And they may have women and children with them as well, but for sure they were men, right? And they were definitely tough because we know, and I I didn't go deep into it, but they had wars with other tribes and all this stuff, right? And they find water which is essential for them. It is essential. Like you need water to drink. They need it. And obviously they're thirsty. They've been traveling in the desert. And they don't find anybody there but a woman alone and a little child. There's no government. There's no police. You can't call 911. You can't call the National Guard. You can't sue them. You can't hashtag me too. You can't cancel culture them. You can't shame them. There's, there's nothing. Right? So what do you do? And they're not Muslim. And they don't have any Sharia to stop them. What do you do? Well, I mean, from the animalistic nature of man, you kill the woman or you take her as a whatever. Maybe you keep the child as a slave or you kill it and you take the water. But subhanAllah, Allah chose certain qaba'in to bring certain people because of certain good qualities that they had. These were honorable people. They went 
and they asked. They didn't demand, they didn't pull out swords, they didn't say, break yourself, this is mine now. You guys, think, think here in America. If we had no government, no police, no military, nobody to stop, and a, a, a band of guys are in need of water, and they find some water somewhere, you think they're going to be like, excuse me, you mind if I get some water? They asked, can we take from your water? Now Hajar salam, this is her bravery as well. You see a band of guys with swords coming, you're by yourself as a woman, you'd be like, I gotta run, I gotta bounce, protect me and my baby. No, she stayed and she told them, you can drink from it, but you have no rights to it. That is, like I said, braver than our brothers today. She said, yes, you can drink from it. We're, we're going to share with you. But don't act like you own it. And this is what Allah gave us. Right? And they told her, fine. It's your water. We will respect. And that shows a great character. They respected that. And they drank from it. And they shared their food with her. And because they had water here, they decided to settle here. Jurhum, they settled to make the city of Mecca. And here now, you have company, you have food, and you have water. Tell you, what food did they have? Could they farm? La, it was in Medina. Could they grow rice and wheat? And no, the land of Mecca is not fertile. If you go to Mecca, it's harsh rock. You can't plant. Maybe you can get some date trees and stuff, but even that you needed water for. Now you have water. But what was their food as Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has told us it was just meat and water. Laham al ma. Sahih hadith. Now, when I taught this dars the first time, and some of you brothers that were here, there were some brothers that objected to this. Oh man, how do you survive on meat and water? That man. Now, you got your, what's that, uh, Atkins and Keto. <laughs> now everybody's going to cut out rice and bread and things like this. Now people are going towards it. But however it may have been, but that was it. They would hunt and they would get meat. The men were hunters and they would have water there. And in the hadith, it just mentions those. Some of the ulema of tariq said that it is possible that they would get dates and things like this. But they didn't have rice and bread and things like this. Maybe not even a lot of fruits and things because it was not fertile land. But they would live off it. Ibrahim salam in this time comes back. And as I said, he repeated and come back. And wallahu alam. But maybe at this time he made the dua a second time for the, for the people there because he used al-balad. So now it was settled. He sticks up on his son Ismail. And Ismail salam is loved by Jurhum. They see him to be pious. They see him to be good mannered. Even though ethnically he's not from them. He's not from Jurhum. He is from the lineage of Ibrahim a.s. But he settles with them and he learns Arabic from them. He becomes Arab by learning Arabic. Not by DNA. Now he lives from them. And Ibrahim a.s. Comes to him and he's a young man. And he tells them, tells his son, Allah has given me a vision. Now he's a Nabi. Don't, don't get confused. Like don't go home and try to slaughter your kids because you think you had a vision. No, none of you are Anbiya and none of you will get Wahid. But Ibrahim alayhi salam is a Nabi. And he gets Wahid. And his Wahid is through his dream. And his wahi is to slaughter his son. What we know is Ismail salam is very young at this time. Because Ishaq salam is not born at this time. So Ismail salam is not a grown man. He's very young. Now imagine for the young brothers here. You have a pious father, let's say. And your father comes to you and tells you, but he's not there for you. Like, like, you know how people complain, my dad wasn't there for me. I got psychological problems. 
Ibrahim is not there for him. He's gone. He comes and visits, but he's not there. And he comes to you and he tells you, I've seen a vision. He tells you, what's your vision? My vision is I'm slaughtering you. You'd be like, dad lost it. Child protective services. I'm going to be up out the mix. You aren't even here for me. You didn't even raise me. And now you want to come back and kill me? Again, Ismail alayhi salam. Look at the love he had for his father. Look at the obedience. He says, my father, if Allah has given this vision, fulfill it. Do it and you will find me inshallah from those that are patient. Look at the lessons for us. How do we not contemplate on this? Father takes a knife. Again, there are ayat and ahadith. I'm just giving you the summary from it. What is authentic. And now he's going to slaughter his own son. How difficult is that on the father? Not just any son, but a pious son. Not just any son, but a son that will be a Nabi. Not just any son, but a son that you had at an old age. Not just any son, but your one son. This is Ibrahim. Every time he's tested, he passes his test. Every time I'm tested, I fail. May Allah forgive me. So he takes his son, but he can't do it. I mean, like physically, it's very difficult. So he closes his eyes, and he takes his son and he slaughters. Oh, he thought the story was different. He slaughters, and he opens his eyes, and what he has is a lamb. And his son is plain. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never waste you. Allah will never let zulm happen at your hand. If you are upon the Quran, the Sunnah, if you're on the Haqq, if you're on the truth, Allah will never, as long as you follow that which Allah has ordered, you will never be a zalim. You will never be an oppressor. A point of aqidah, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so just, that he would not let Ibrahim السلام, slaughter his innocent son. How do you think he would let his own son be slaughtered? Allah has no kids. Allah has no sons. But just as a point of reference for Christians, what kind of a volume and oppressive God would allow his own child to be innocent child to be slaughtered? He couldn't forgive people for sins for unforgiveness? No, Allah is just. Allah has no children. And Ibrahim السلام, did not slaughter his son, but Allah tested him and he passed. Not only did he pass, but Ismail السلام, also passed. He obeyed his father. Ibrahim السلام, goes back. He comes back. Visits again. Ismail السلام, now is a grown man. He's married, the people of Jurham gave him their daughter from Jurham, he married her, and he's living. And what does he do for a living? He goes and hunts with the men, they're hunters. They go and they hunt, and when they bring the food back, they eat meat, drink water from Zamzam. Here, Ibrahim السلام, has come after a long time. So when he comes here, People don't recognize him. He goes, he's an old man. He goes to the house of his son. And he asks for some water and things. And the wife of Ismail, alayhi salam, she thinks this is some old needy person, a traveler, he's not from here. And out of hospitality, she gives him. And he asks her, daughter, and he calls her a daughter out of love, and he tells her, and you're young. How's life? How's your life? How are things in this place? And she says, horrible. I'm summarizing. Here. Very harsh life. We just have meat and water and hot. And it's a very difficult life. And, you know, we're, we're doing it, but it's, you know, it's very tough. Tell her, okay. When your husband comes back, tell him an old man came and said, change the doorstep or the entrance to your door. It would be the 
in Pashto we say Durshan. It's like it's kind of like the the entrance step and what's around it to your door. So she's say kind of a weird message, but okay. And he leaves. Ismail alayhi salam now, after a day or two or whatever time has passed, comes back from his hunt. And he asks her, and this is from the faras or the intelligence and the ability of a, of a, of a mu'min and a, a nabi, obviously, that he realizes something has happened. He tells her, what happened? How are things? What, did somebody come? And she says, yeah, old man came. He said, okay. What did he say? Not much, but he said, change your doorstep. He said, okay. He said, do you know who this was? He's like, no. He said, this is my father, Ibrahim. And he's stolen, telling me to divorce you. Subhanallah. For the young brothers here. What a test for Ismail. Any, those of you that are not married, that's the only thing you want to do is get married. <laughs> I want to get married. Brother Amhan, look. Brother, you got any connections? You got anybody? Any? And then when you get married, and you're newly wed, like you're young, it's not like you're past the years where now you're sick of your wife. No, you're at that time where you're young, and you're, oh, oh, oh you, you, you guys, oh, never mind. Um, so you're young, and at this time, your father that wasn't even there for the wedding, he wasn't even there to get you married, comes and tells you, divorce your wife. Is she a kafira? No. Is she drinking alcohol or disobedient? No. What is it? Unthankful. Now, what a test. What does Ismail alayhi salam do? Does he say, well, let me wait. Let me wait till he comes back. Let me try to reason with him. What's the reason you want me to divorce? What, what, what the heck am I behind this dad? No, he divorces her. Khawas. Years pass, Jurham, they love him so much, they get him married to another girl. The tribe of Jurham. Ibrahim alayhi salam comes back. Nobody recognizes him now. Years have passed. Old man doesn't come in. I'm Ibrahim. Yo, get up. You know who I am? No. Just comes, goes to the house, asks for some water, asks her daughter, how's life? She says, Alhamdulillah, life is good. Alhamdulillah, we have food, we have drink, life is good. Now, what is the difference in the lifestyle of the first wife and the second wife? Nothing. Did they suddenly move to like a place with gardens and uh, restaurants and rice and bread being baked and fresh juices being... No! Same meat. Same water, same hunting, same Mecca, same weather, same harsh conditions. What's the difference? Shukr and kufr. Being thankful or unthankful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your situation is not the problem. Your attitude is the problem. Your situation is not the problem. No matter what situation you're in, it is all about your attitude. If you are thankful in a tent in a war-torn refugee camp with bombs falling, you will have the best of life. And if you are unthankful, you will be in Donald Trump's sweet tower with butlers and you will have a miserable life. Learn how to be thankful in your environment, you will enjoy your life. Otherwise, you will be miserable no matter what you have. Ibrahim alayhi salam, he tells her, when your husband comes back, tell him an old man came by. They didn't tell her, I'm her father, I'm Ibrahim. No. And he said, keep your doorstep. That's it. And he leaves. Ismail alayhi salam comes back. He asks her, what happened? She tells him, some old man came by and he just said this. He tells her, do you know who this was? She says, no. He tells her, this was my father Ibrahim and he's telling me to keep you. I want to end on a very important point. 
Ibrahim alayhi salam, no doubt he was tested and he passed his tests. But Ismail alayhi salam was tested and he passed his tests. Imagine how difficult it is that your father leaves you in a desert with nothing. Years go back, he buy, he doesn't send you money, he doesn't send you gifts, he doesn't send you anything. When you see him after all that time, you don't say, because of you I go to therapy and because of you this and why did you not let me do this and why? No. He loves him. He respects him. Father comes back and tells him, I'm going to slaughter you. <laughs> he tells him, my father, if you are on the Quran, I mean, if you, meaning not as we would be in our time on the Quran or Sunnah at that time, if you are under wahi, Allah has ordered you, do as you ordered, you will find me patient. After that, alhamdulillah, you didn't get slaughtered. Alhamdulillah, he comes back, tells you, divorce your wife. He's not like, come on, man. First, you just left us. You left my mom and me. You didn't raise me. You left. Then you come back, try to kill me. Then you come back and try to ruin my house. No. Khawas, divorce her, divorce her. Why? This is the right of the father. We have many lectures on the status of the mother in Islam. And no doubt, and no doubt to the status of the mother of Islam. Today I'm going to talk about the status of the father in Islam. And inshallah, if brothers want, they can clip this out. We don't care. Make video clips and post them just this part. A man came to Rasulullah and said, my father is spending my wealth. And he's old. He's not bringing in money. I'm making money. And he comes and spends my wealth. Without my prayer, just come and spend it. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the sahih hadith said, you and your wealth belong to your father. Where did you get wealth from? Well, you were born with it? Who raised you? You and your wealth belong to your father. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the hadith reported by Atirmi and Ibn Majah and Imam Ahmed, and Ibn Habban. Sahih Hadith. Imam Al-Tirmidhi graded to be Hassan Sahih. As Shaykh Al-Albani in his Takhrij considered to be Sahih. Authentic Hadith said, Al-Walid, the father, is the awsat bab al jannah is the middle door to the Jannah. What does it mean, middle? Al-Qadi. Who is Al-Qadi? Al-Qadi al-Baydawi. You should know. When you read a book, you should know the istilahat. If this is Al-Qadi, what you have to say? Is Al-Qadi Abu Ya'la? Is Al-Qadi uh, Ayyad? Is Al-Qadi Abu Yusuf? No, Al-Qadi Al-Baydawi. He says, Awsat or Wasat huna bil ma'ina aqrab wa ahsan. The closest, the dearest, the best door to enter Jannah for you is your father. Abu Darda radiallahu anhu mentioned this hadith marfu'an from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Walid, not walidain. Everybody's like parents, the translation parents. La, when it's walida, you don't want to translate to parents. When it's walid, why did you make la father here? Aqrab the closest, the easiest. Abu Darda here, he mentions in the hadith, he says, if you wish, you protect it. If you wish, you lose it. Meaning if you obey your father, you protect your entrance into Jannah. If you disobey your father, you ruin it. Now, as a disclaimer, this is when your father is religious. If he's on the Quran or Sunnah. If your father is a drunk uh, telling you to sin, there is no obedience to the makhluk and the disobedience to the khaliq. Do not obey your father or mother in disobeying Allah. But if it's not the disobedience of Allah, it's obligatory upon you. How many doors to Jannah? Eight. How many doors to Jahannam? Seven. seven. The seven doors to Jahannam are mentioned in the Quran, that there is seven. The number eight for Jannah is not mentioned in the Quran, but there are indications in ayat about the doors and entrance to Jannah. Eight doors to Jannah are mentioned in Sahih Hadith, that there are eight doors. In Bukhari and Muslim, for example, the hadith about the dua after wudu and the doors of Jannah and so on. The hadith of Ibn Mas'ud, sahih, authentic, where he said there are eight doors to Jannah as well. That one is an intermediate. In different ahadith, Rasulullah gave different 
names of those rayyan for example which is for those who are people who fast it doesn't mean you fast ramadan khalas i'm going to rayyan every muslim fast through ramadan like it is those that love to fast that are that are steady and always fasting this babel jihad it doesn't mean you fight jihad once in your life khalas you're not every muslim when it's obligatory upon you you have to fight but those that love jihad fi sabilillah for them there is this bab there is bab al hajj there is there, there is a bab eight a bab bab al salah doesn't mean you just make your fard salah khalas no those that love the salah but the closest the best the ahsan bab bab al walid this is the door to enter jannah and that's what ismail alayhi salam understood and that's what we forget today Here, there is a lot to discuss, but since this is not a dars about Ibrahim alayhi salam and Ismail alayhi salam, here we continue, Ismail alayhi salam died. And where he's buried, wallahu a'lam. We do not know where he's buried. Some people think he's buried in the Hijr. They call it Hijr Ismail, Hatim. This is not established. This is not true. Yes, there is a place there, but we do not know that Ismail alayhi salam, where he's buried, Allah knows best. The only Nabi that we can be a hundred percent sure about his grave is Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Past that, we cannot be a hundred percent sure about anybody's grave. Where is Adam alayhi salam buried? Wallahu alam. Where is Ismail alayhi salam buried? Wallahu alam. Where is Ibrahim alayhi salam buried? Wallahu alam. I know Majid Ibrahim and all the places. Wallahu alam. But Ismail alayhi salam died in Mecca. Jurhum then got attacked by another qabila. And because they were being overpowered, they hid Zamzam. Zamzam, they buried it. They hid it. And there we will pick up at the next dars, inshallah ta'ala. <laughs>